Go ahead. Uh, today, uh, our speaker is Professor Krishnendu Sengupta from School of Physics, IACS, Kolkata. He is going to speak about ballistic transport in topological materials. Uh, this is 97th talk in the series. And uh, we all are welcoming Professor Sengupta for uh, agreeing to give this talk for this forum through ASTM. And uh, you can start. Okay, I would like to begin by thanking Sharanton for inviting me here. I mean, it has been, uh, it's a really nice feeling. And uh, so, uh, one thing I just have to mention your uh, sound is coming a little bit. Uh, yeah, there is a problem with the laptop, but can you hear me now? Yes, yes. Now, now it is. Okay. So, um, okay. So the topic of the talk today is ballistic transport in topological materials. And I'm going to cover a range of 2D and 3D topological materials, then things like graphene, topological insulators, and Dirac and wild semi-metals, or mostly wild and multi-wild semi-metals actually. And uh, for each of these, there would be a very brief uh, introduction followed by some transport property, ballistic transport property. Uh, and most of these properties are a bit unconventional in the sense that you are not going to find it in normal metals or other standard ballistic uh, transport things that we typically study in our CONMAT course or you know, even in quantum mechanics. So with that, let me start with the most, uh, oops, let me see. Uh, okay, so let me start with the most famous of them all, uh, graphene, okay, which is uh, the, uh, okay, so which is one of the earliest known uh, material which uh, discovered in 2000, around 2004, where they found this uh, Dirac-like physics at low energies, and let me try to explain how that comes about, okay. So graphene, it turns out, is a 3D allotrope of carbon. Um, so, so, okay, graphite, as you know, is a 3D allotrope of carbon, which is most commonly found in our pencil tips, okay? And that's a very simple compound, uh, simple uh, stuff. And apparently this is carbon whose form uh, is such that it has a quasi two-dimensional structure. These are like hexagonal planes, which are loosely coupled to each other. You see the picture right here. And uh, because the coupling within the plane is very strong, and the coupling uh, between the planes, that is interplanar coupling is very weak, uh, therefore the properties of this graphene, uh, graphite is quite anisotropic. And one of the first persons to come up with this anisotropic property has been K. S. Krishnan, who in 19, around 1941 first pointed out that uh, this anisotrope, that graphene has poor propagation of phonons and electrons uh, out of plane and good propagation in plane. Okay, so so for example, if you measure thermal conductivity, it's it has a high value if you are measuring it inside in plane, whereas in the c axis, well, on the c axis it's uh, rather low. And this was done as early as in 1941, and that too from ISS which was one of the very few research institutes in the country at that point. So uh, what is graphene? Graphene happens to be a single layer of this graphite. So you look at these planes out here. So if one could separate one of these planes and uh, you know just make a two-dimensional structure out of that, that would be graphene. So experimental separation of graphene has been a long-standing challenge. And the reason it has been a long-standing challenge is that people could, of course, cleave graphite and go to a few hundred layers of graphite, but to get a single plane was challenging, okay? So incidentally, there is a nice anecdote in this case. Um, I, I have a question. So sure. You have mentioned that there's a weak coupling between the layers, okay? So, yes. So, so is it experimentally observed or during theory people have... Doing theory. It's done both. So people have computed the uh, band structure of graphene as early as in uh, graphite, actually, as early as in 40s, I guess. 1949 was the first paper by Wallace. 
but even before that krishnan was one of the first guys who came up with experiments to show through transport measurement that you know this properties are anisotropic okay. that 1941 okay. so it's very well known both experimentally and theoretically okay okay thank you, thank you. sure okay so then uh, what one sees is that um, this kind of stuff um, so okay so people were trying to isolate this you know uh, this plane of uh, well a single plane of graphite and it turned out that uh, uh, this was the problem that amjay dai who finally achieved this feat uh, gave to a postdoc in his group who was from china and this guy you know of course uh, you know tried very hard and then one day he went to dai and said that look this cannot be done i am doing this i have tried every possible trick and all i can get is a few hundred layers but not less so uh, dai of course was a busy boss you know and he said that well why don't you try some more to which the poster well, who was already frustrated by all this hard work and everything said that um, well why don't you try it and guy uh, unlike most of the bosses uh, took up that challenge okay so he went to the lab and he started doing this experiment and he found out that the postdoc was absolutely correct in the sense that the cleaving technique is not going to give you anything like a few layers of graphene graphite okay what uh, he but he also noticed that while cleaving this the first step of doing that is polishing the surface of graphite which is typically done with a scotch tape so you take this tape and you put it over the surface of graphite to make it smooth now what andre guy noticed and that was his brilliance that apparently very thin flakes of graphite comes up and gets stuck with the tape during this process and when he put them when he put such a scotch tape under microscope he found that some of these are really a few layers of graphene and some are even single layer of graphene so he what he did was to isolate one of these and then he put some gate around it and measured and did some measurement and that was the first experiment on a single layer graphene okay so uh, he mentioned that our graphene films were prepared by mechanical exfoliation bracket repeated peeling of small masses of highly oriented prolic pyrolytic graphite and this approach was found to be highly reliable and allowed us to prepare uh, films up to 10 micrometer in size so that was how graphene came into existence okay and now uh, having described much more experiments than what i actually know let me come to theory and try to sort of tell you a relative relevant basics about graphene and so, i have a question yes please. maybe it is like very like basic question but i'm just asking so you said that this polishing of the surface is required why this is important oh it's important because you see you don't want to so, so in the event that you are able to get your final sample you want as little dirt and as little inhumidity as you could on the so you know the first thing that you do in any lab before you clean or do anything to a sample is to make it clean by polishing with a tip that's very standard actually in most cases and uh, once you polish you yeah. have to uh, in, uh, implement some material on the top of no no this is not at the level where you implement materials or anything this is at the level where you are just taking the bulk of the sample and trying to make a film out of it oh okay okay uh so the first step of this is to make the surface clean that's all okay good hey thank you sure okay so um okay next let me come to this relative relevant basics about graphene so graphene is an allotrope of uh, so graphite as you know is an allotrope of carbon and here each unit cell of a uh, carbon atom is uh, has to uh, okay so it's sp2 hybridized okay so um, it has um, it it has this uh, sp2 hybridized orbitals with uh, pz orbitals which are left out out of this hybridization process so when you 
combine these two such atoms, it turns out that these sp2 hybridized orbitals fuse to form what is called the sigma bonds, and the pz orbitals will form what is called the pi bond. Okay, so that's a bit of chemistry. And then if you hybridize, if you come, at, so if you bring a lot of these together to form our sample, it turns out that these pi bonds essentially, you know, muted to give you something called the pi band, which is what gives electrons at the Fermi surface. Okay, and the sigma bonds essentially muted to give you the sigma band of graphene, which is the inert band, which is uh, which is which doesn't have any presence at the Fermi level. Okay, so. That's sort of a chemist's perspective. For a physicist's perspective, uh, this, gra this graphene is essentially a bunch of electrons on a honeycomb lattice, as shown here. And uh, the simplest model is to model these electrons to be non-interacting and having a kinetic energy. And the kinetic energy is modeled by just a hopping of electron from one lattice site to the next. So you would start from one of these sites, and there are three possible ways to hop. And that essentially is the model that people work with. Okay. Uh, can you give me one second, Shantan? Sorry. No problem. I mean, the talk here, I see, we talk with you, we talk with you. Yeah, sorry. So uh, essentially, then what happens is that, um, you know, so that's sort of the time binding model that people work with. Okay. Now, why is this important? Well, this time binding model is not the garden variety type binding model that we typically use in laboratories. And the reason for this is that, um, you see, if you look at this honeycomb lattice, you see that there are two inequivalent sites out here. The first type of site is called A sub lattice and the second one is B sub lattice. And why are these inequivalent? Because the surroundings of this A sub lattice, uh, A sites form an inverted, forms of Y, while that of B forms an inverted Y. So from a crystallographic point of view, these are inequivalent, okay? And therefore, your unit cell has two basis points containing one A and one B cells. And you can just sort of move them in different directions to span this honeycomb lattice, okay? So once we recognize that there are these A sub lattice and B sub lattice or A type sites or B type sites, I can certainly ask the question that what is the probability of finding an electron on an A lattice or a B site, okay? And that means this is somewhat like asking that, suppose this electron has a fictitious spin whose up state means that it's on an A site and its down state means it's on a B site. Then I'm just asking about the magnetization, this fictitious magnetization of an electron, okay? And this, Fictitious spin has a name in the literature. It's called a pseudo spin, but it really has to do with this sub lattice index. So, just like a spinner, this electron, uh, this uh, degree of freedom of the electron is also destroyed by a two component wave function. The top component, psi A, tells you the probability amplitude of finding it in site A, and psi B, the probability amplitude of finding the electron in psi B. Therefore, the upshot of having this two-site unit cell is that uh, you, you need to deal with a spinner wave function, okay? And in graphene, this, this degree of freedom is called a single spin degree of freedom. Uh, so, I have two questions. Yeah. Uh, so, the information of this pseudo spin has to be taken care of in this side, the wave function. That's right. Yeah. And second one is basically that uh, I can understand this is a honeycomb lattice and how you have constructed, but I yeah. think uh, is it an infinite size lattice system or it has? Uh, for now, yes. For most of the time, when I am going to talk about it, it is infinite size. Okay. Terminate it at some point, and then you would have ages. Yes. You would have a uh, age which is like a zigzag age. You can see the shape of the age out here, or called an armchair edge or something in between depending on the type of cut you make and these edges have properties you know the electrons uh, have specific localized states at the edges and stuff but i'm not going to talk about that in this talk okay sure so now once you know that uh, you have a type binding model 
you see in this graphene, if you are sitting on one of these sites, which is like an A site, then if you hop once, you are always going to go to one of the B sites. Okay. So this is easy to see from here, uh, hopping from A always goes to a B and vice versa. So if you just have the nearest neighbor interaction, it turns out that in real space, this is in the AB basis, it always gives you an off diagonal term. Okay, and this T is the T hat is the hopping operator. And this is the model for nearest neighbor kinetic energy of graphene. Notice that even in this simple thing, there is this two by two matrix structure. And these, uh, this matrix structure occurs because there are two pseudo spin degrees of freedom. Okay. And this is not the real electron spin, this is the pseudo spin. Okay. So now what do you do? You sort of diagonalize it by going into momentum space because we all know that a hopping problem, the easiest thing to do is to diagonalize it in momentum space. And if this tau one, tau two, tau three are the three unit vectors, what happens is that you just get a factor like this, HK, this is just a Fourier transform, and HK and HK forms the uh, basis. Then you diagonalize this Hamiltonian, which is really simple, and this gives you the energy dispersion of the two bands. Okay. So it turns out that uh, this can be exactly calculated, so I'm not going to get into the details, but let me just show you the bands. So that these two bands, uh, you see that these two bands, one of them has negative energy, and this negative energy is with respect to zero. The band bottom is the lowest negative energy that you can have. And uh, so there is no, so typically if you measure energy from the band bottom, everything is positive energy, but you don't do that. You measure it from some E equal to zero, which is obtained by putting this quantity to so zero. So here, this T yeah. parameter is the hopping parameter or something like that? It's the hopping parameter, yes. Oh, and, okay. 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 So uh, what happens is that one of the band has negative energies and the other is positive, and therefore you know they touch only at zero energies. And the interesting thing is that they touch at discrete points, which are at the edge of this uh, graphene below zone. Now the point is that this is a bit unusual because typically for a metal, if you are in three dimension, for example, you have a Fermi surface which is two dimensional. If you are in two dimension, you have Fermi line, which is one dimensional. So typically the Fermi surface of a metal is D minus one dimensional for a D dimensional bulk material. Here it turns out that because of the geometry involved, you basically have Fermi points, which is not a typical characteristic of two dimensional material, but here it happens. Okay? And out of the six Fermi points, six corners of the Brillouin zone, two of them are inequivalent. They are called the K and the K prime points. Uh, the rest are connected to this K and K prime point by a reciprocal lattice vector. So they are really equivalent in that sense. Okay? And if you zoom around this one of these points, either the K or the K prime point, you see that the energy dispersion around this point is linear. So you just need to expand this energy around this uh, K, the K capital K point, okay, so which is the edge of this Brillouin zone. It has a fixed wave vector, and one can do the math. I'm just skipping over details here, but that's not important. What is important is that it has a linear dispersion, okay, with two bands which crosses each other at the uh, Fermi energy, which is uh, this uh, at the at the zone edge, and therefore what you have is the linear dispersion and that two by two matrix structure, which comes from the fact that your Hamiltonian was a two by two uh, uh, had a two by two matrix structure because of the pseudo spin degree of freedom, and in two plus one d, that's the description that a Dirac theory has. Remember that these Dirac theories, uh, Dirac matrices in two dimension are essentially the Pauli matrices. Okay. So this is how the low energy theory of uh, graphene essentially hosts Dirac-like quasi-particles with linear dispersion rather than Schrodinger-like quasi-particles with uh, quadratic dispersions. Okay. So now let me go to the, uh, so let me sum up this part. So what happens is that uh, at low energies, um, if you now consider the two, so you have a two uh, component degrees of freedom, but if you consider both K and K prime points, which are typically called valleys, then there is a two by two matrix associated with this, and you can have a four by four uh, wave function, 
And um, one can write down an effective Hamiltonian around uh, around this uh, touching points, which is Dirac. Okay. So for the rest of the talk, we are going to be around the k point where this tau three, which is which tells you whether uh, you are at the k point or the k prime point, will just be one, and therefore your Hamiltonian would be just sigma dot k. That is sigma x k x plus sigma y k. Okay. So. What are the properties that are uh, typical out here? So if you take this Hamiltonian, you know, the sigma dot k, and solve for its energies, you find that the wave function typically uh, has uh, value one and then plus or minus e to the power i gamma. So I'm going to just take the plus sign, which corresponds to plus moving, uh, right moving quasi particles in along the k point. Now this gamma is the angle. It tells you the direction of motion of this electron in that particular IU state. Okay, so you see that when, for example, if an electron in this IU state is moving along, let's say x, so that k y is equal to zero, gamma is equal to zero, and psi k is one one, which means it's in an IU state of sigma x. And similarly, you can try this with any direction. So it turns out that the electron spin or pseudo spin in this case, it always points along its direction of motion, and this is well known in high energy physics. It's, this property is called the helicity. Here, this helicity turns out to involve pseudo spin and not spin, which means that if the electron is moving along x, its wave function is an equal superposition of uh, amplitude. Along a and amplitude along b. Okay, it's a linear superposition state of psi a and psi b. So the other point is that um, uh, you can dope this graphing so that uh, the density so so that the density increases. So pristine graphing is at half filling so that the lower band is completely occupied and the upper band is empty. However, the dope graphing can have a finite density of electrons over and above half filling, and that would give rise to a Fermi surface. Now the other thing which is interesting here is that the density of state of graphene electrons around the Fermi surface, and it's typically you know rho of e. If you do this calculation, it turns out to be linearly proportional to uh, energy if you are if you are at pristine graphene, okay, where E f is zero, and this is interesting because it turns out that uh, as you approach the Fermi point, the density of states uh, vanishes linearly. And this is why graphene is called a semi-metal. It's not an insulator because it's not capped, but it's not quite a metal because the available number of electrons, as you approach the Fermi surface, vanishes. So these are typically called semi-metals. Okay. Graphene is an example of uh, semi-metal. Okay. So now let me come to transporting graphene. Okay. So the transporting graphene is quite an interesting uh, thing. It's uh, to understand this. Let me first uh, talk about a very simple quantum mechanical problem where I have a potential barrier and I direct a Schrodinger electron, an electron which obeys Schrodinger equation, to this barrier. So what would happen? We all know that the electron would be reflected back with certain amplitude and transmitted with certain else. And you know, in our first level quantum mech, we basically compute this transmission probability, which is given by one minus mod r squared, which in this simple setting is also mod t squared. And that's given by this expression, where this chi is the dimensionless barrier strength, which depends on v naught, which is the height of this barrier, d, which is its thickness. Now the point is that as I increase the barrier height compared to the energy, when v naught is much, much larger than e, T is a monotonically decreasing function of the barrier strength, which is expected that if you have a really large barrier, you know, uh, then of course your uh, transmission decreases. That is our standard expectation from single particle quantum mechanics. However, when you do the same calculation with a massless Dirac electron in two dimension, it turns out that uh, you know when you do a few pages of calculation and then the dust settles. You find out that you get a transmission which is uh, not a monotonically decreasing function of the barrier strength. So, if your dimensionless barrier potential again is chi, which is v naught t divided by h per v, and gamma is the angle of incident at which this uh, thing approaches the barrier, okay, then uh, what happens 
is that uh, the transmission goes as cos square gamma divided by one minus cos square chi times sine square gamma. So this immediately has two repercussions. The first one is that if you have normal incidence, that is if you have gamma equal to zero, then clearly the transmission is unity for any value of the barrier potential. And that and this property, this paradoxical property is known and it's uh, typically called, uh, it's called the Klein paradox, okay? And uh, this uh, Klein paradox essentially um, was pointed out by Oscar Klein right after, um, you know, uh, Dirac came up with this theory for massive Dirac electrons, but here we are seeing it for massless Dirac electrons. So what happens is the, that this unit transmission can be understood as the inability of a scalar potential to flip spin. So let me explain. So when we put in this potential, you know, it has amplitude both on the A sublattice and the B sublattice. It really doesn't care. Which means in the sublattice space, that is in the pseudo spin space, this potential is a scalar. And we know from our basic scattering theory that uh, scalar potential cannot flip, potentials cannot flip spins, i.e. pseudo spin. Uh, in this case, pseudo spin. And now imagine that a graphene electron moves and hits this barrier. If it needs to be flipped, I mean, if its direction of motion needs to be reversed, it's, uh, because of this helicity property, pseudo spin needs to be flipped. However, this is impossible for the barrier, uh, for the potential. And therefore, you know, this potential just no other alternative but just let, but then just let the electron, let the electron go. So normal transmission essentially means uh, because of the inability of the scalar potential to flip pseudo spin, the transmit uh, reflection goes to zero and transmission goes to unity. But then there is this another um, phenomenon. It's called transmission resonance. That is, uh, for any angle of incidence, uh, transmission could be one if the barrier potential takes on some special values, which is integer multiple of pi. And this works only when you are in the thin barrier limit, that is V0 is large compared to typical energy scales in the problem. And D is small compared to typical length scales in the problem. So that the product V0 D is finite, okay? So that's called the thin barrier limit. So in the thin barrier limit, there is this transmission resonance that T is an oscillatory function of the dimensionless barrier strain. And therefore, in this case, you should expect qualitatively different transport properties than that of the Schrodinger vectors. Okay. So now, let me now talk a bit about superconductivity and junctions, uh, really a very small introduction. So uh, what do we mean by transport across the junctions? Well, the cartoon picture is that when you put an electric two normal metals, and when you jam them together, there is always some insulator in the surface because, you know, because of lattice mismatch or other things, there is always an effective insulating layer on the surface. And now if you apply a voltage, you are displacing Fermi surface of the left metal with respect to the right. And the electron on the left Fermi surface sees that if it can somehow tunnel through this insulating barrier, then there are a lot of available states to the right. So it does that. And therefore, this the results in char charge transport. And therefore, uh, this charge transport leads to a current and the tunneling conductance, what we measure is the rate of change of this current with respect to the voltage. So we say di dv, you know, which is the tunneling conductance. But when it comes to a superconductor and you make such a junction, you see that the superconductor, as you know, has a gap around this Fermi surface, which is the superconducting gap. So typically what you would assume is as long as the applied voltage is smaller than the gap, then the quasi-particle here really doesn't have any um, uh, available states to the right. And therefore, it will there would be no charge transport. So the typical expectation is that as long as you have sub-gap voltage, that is voltage less than that of this gap delta naught, your tunneling conductance is going to go to zero. However, this is not entirely true. What happens is that there is a very interesting new mechanism, which is uh, called, um, there is a very, oops, sorry, there is a very interesting new mechanism, which is uh, called Andrew reflection. 
So what happens is that in a superconductor, the ground state is composed of uh, Cooper pairs. Okay. So essentially, uh, when an electron approaches, um, ground state is composed of Cooper pair, and the excitation over the ground state is a superposition of electrons and holes. Okay. So when the electron approaches the uh, superconductor, it turns out that by some virtual process, uh, one can excite an electron hole pair, which is a bubble of quasi particle, from the uh, superconducting condenser. The hole comes out in the other direction, and the electron which goes in binds with the remaining electron to form a Cooper pair. Now, this Cooper pair can propagate even uh, even around Fermi surface because the gap that I mentioned in the last uh, slide out here is a gap for superconducting quasi particles. It's not a gap for Cooper pairs. Okay? So once this Cooper pair passes, there is a unit twice the charge transfer because two of the electron goes in, and this phenomenon which leads to twice the charge tra charge transfer and reflection of a hole is known as Andre reflection. And this undue reflection is the main method or main way of charge transfer when the voltages are small in a superconducting junction. However, that the point is that if you essentially make your junction barrier large, then this undue reflection essentially this amplitude is suppressed. And this is all known by calculations in the 80s by Blonder, Tingham, and Klausik. And uh, as you go from the strength of this insulating layer to be zero to some finite value, you see that the subcap tunneling conductance essentially goes from two, which refers to these two units of charge transfer, to zero. Okay, so that zero bars or the subcap tunneling conductance in a superconductor is always a dimension uh, is a monotonically decreasing function of the barrier strength of the intermediate insulating layer. Now that is for shunning the electron, but the questions that we asked is what is what happens if you do this with graphene? So now the point is that the graphene is not a normal superconductor, natural superconductor. So you need to bring in a superconducting electrode on one half of a graphene sample and make it superconducting. And you make a barrier by putting in a gate voltage in some intermediate layer. The rest of the sample is normal graphene. And this gives you a normal metal superconductor interface. And you ask that what is the behavior of this tunneling conductance? How would the tunneling conductance of such a junction behave as a function of the gate voltage? And what we found, so what do you do? You essentially calculate the thing using a BTK formalism coupled with a Dirac theory. I'm not going to get into the details of this, but the point is that um, one can do this calculation and calculate the tunneling conductance. And what we find here is very, very interesting. What we find is that the tunneling conductance, instead of being a monotonically decreasing function of the barrier strength, and this is the tunneling conductance at applied voltage close to zero, which is the zero bias tunneling conductance, it is an oscillatory function of the barrier strength, and it exhibits pi periodic oscillations. And this is what we found out. And uh, you would find similar unconventional oscillatory behavior in Josephson junctions as well, and I'm going to come to that in a moment. But the point is that this behavior, which takes its root from the direct nature of the graphene quasi particles, is fundamentally different from transport properties of all superconducting junctions that have been studied in the past. Okay. So, and the reason why this happens is the following. So when you try to calculate this tunneling conductance, uh, you see that tunneling requires, uh, successful tunneling requires that there is charge transport across the uh, junction. So this is certainly one minus mod R squared, one minus um, the probability of reflection. But for superconducting case, there is also a mod R S squared, which tells you that the probability, if there is an undue reflection, you need to add that probability because undue reflection leads to twice the charge transfer. Now, so when is this probability maximum and therefore the tunneling maximum? Of course, when mod R square is zero. Okay, so that's these are all positive numbers, and you see clearly that if mod R square is zero, then this quantity is maximum. Now we could calculate R 
okay and what one finds is that this is the expression for this r okay it's proportional to this quantity where chi is the dimensionless barrier strength so it turns out i'm not going to get into the details of all the possible cases and stuff like that but from this expression you could see that when chi is a half integer multiple of pi uh, this r goes to zero and this is the point where this transmission peaks okay because reflection goes to zero you see that there is perfect tunneling conductance out here and uh, this is essentially a transmission resonance condition that we have seen before uh, playing its role for determining uh, graph resonance condition in graphene junctions okay so uh, that is the thing uh, for graphene and we have studied it in different contexts so for example if you now ignore that your barrier is thin you increase the thickness of this barrier so you see that the oscillation persists although what happens is that its amplitude keeps on decreasing and it becomes flatter and flatter uh, as you increase d and of course you know in the limit of very large d none of this persists but the bottom line is that because of this um, tunneling because of the fact that you do have a dirac like quasi particle as the low energy quasi particles in graphene uh, transport gets fundamentally modified and you see features which you never see in standard metals or standard normal metal superconducting junctions okay so next what i wanted to do is to um bring up uh, joseph sum effect okay so now instead of one josephson junction what i'm going to do is to sort of bring in two josephson junctions and put them next to each other so as we know from this fundamental work of josephson that if you do these things and if there is a phase difference between these there is a current which is proportional to the sign of this phase difference between the two junctions and if you basically put in a dc voltage this sign uh, this uh, argument of the sign becomes a time dependent function and so you have an ac current and this is one of the best dc to ac converter that people know of. okay now since then people have worked with many different kinds of josephson junction as a constant and has constructed many varieties of this problem and essentially what happens is that um broadly these josephson junctions can be classified into two um categories and there is a very nice uh, review of modern physics by licker regarding this the first category essentially is when two superconductors are separated by a long normal metal region which is called a weak link and the second one where these superconductors are separated by a tunnel barrier a short tunnel barrier and this is called a tunnel junction so whatever i'm going to talk about in the next few slides is going to be about this tunnel junctions i'm not going to talk about this weak links so in tunnel junction it turns out there is a very elegant method for calculating this josephson current so what one says is that if one takes this two josephson junctions with uh, two superconductors separated by a tunnel barrier with phases phi1 and phi2 one can solve for the energy states uh, of this whole system and one finds that apart from the standard uh, extended state of these two superconductors uh, there are also states which are localized at the junction between these two superconductors and which depends on the phase difference between the two superconductors here phi is phi1 minus phi2 so since um, current is given by the derivative of energy with respect to phase these states control the current because the other extended states do not have phase difference in their uh, dispersion one can show that too and uh, once we know the expression for this energy this subgap tunneling uh, subgap localized unjib bound states by the way these bound states are called unjib bound states so once we know the expressions for these we can find out the expression for the josephson current okay and it turns out that uh, one can calculate the uh, one can calculate this current and the maximum possible current in this for whatever values of phi you want to put in is called the critical current of the junction okay and it turns out that the critical current times the normal state resistance of this junction is a fundamental constant which in the limit of very uh, 
transparent junction, means this barrier potential is very small, goes to pi delta naught over E, and in the limit of very opaque junctions, when this barrier strength is very large, it goes to pi delta naught over E. So in the units of pi delta naught over E, it goes from one to half, okay? So the former uh, case where this junction is transparent is called the kunik umelian chuk limit, and the latter is called the ambigaokar barotop limit. And it turns out that this, both this critical current and ICRN essentially monotonically decrease as we go from one limit to the other. And this is where again graphene SBS junctions are different, as you can imagine, because if we put in a barrier chain, a barrier potential transport across this barrier. Uh, essentially depends on this barrier strength in a mono, in a oscillatory manner, as we have seen before for normal metals. And one can do that problem. And once you do that problem, you find that the, the Josephson current is an oscillatory function of your barrier potential. And, um, you know, so is the critical current. And most interestingly, you never uh, reach the Ambedokar Bharata limit in these junctions because you cannot make the junction very opaque uh, because you know the junction potential appears in the graphene current in a periodic manner. So these junctions essentially never reach the Ambedaukar part of limit. There's another thing where a fundamentally thermodynamic property of a condensed matter junction is modified by Dirac-like nature of the underlying possibility. Okay, so this is all about graphene and its transport that I wanted to talk about. So the next part is uh, is about topological insulators, but before that, any questions? Anything which is unclear or? Uh, any question? Okay, so let me go on actually. So uh, now next I'm going to talk about topological insulators. So what it, it turns out that over the last 10, 12 years, what we have realized is that, uh, you know, certain insulators can have topological properties which shapes the, shapes the property of its band, bands, energy bands, and also leads to very interesting surface physics of this material. So uh, let me just try to go through that. So it turns out that uh, there are class, so historically, insulators are stuff which, um, essentially you have high electrical resistance, okay? So uh, there are of course these classes of insulators. The first one is, uh, 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 but okay. So they are, uh, insulators are properties of solids with high electrical resistance. That's a common uh, way of saying what an insulator is. But for condensed matter physics, there are finer, sub, finer classifications. So broadly speaking, they're classified into three different groups. The first one is called a band insulator, but the energy gap, which makes the thing insulating, arises out of electrons interaction with the lattice potential, which forms these conduction and balance bands and forbidden regions between the bands. And uh, then there are these Anderson insulators where the energy gap or rather insulating properties arises out of electrons interaction with impurities that localizes the wave function and it completely uh, blocks out any transport. And the third one is the Mott insulator, where the energy gap in the spectrum arises out of very strong electron-electron interaction. Historically speaking, this third group has attracted the most attention because those are the things which is very difficult to understand. But now, uh, over the last 12 or 15 years, people have realized that even these band insulators can have very interesting topological properties and they require a proper classification. Now, to understand that, Let's try to begin with a very simple system uh, about these topological properties. Let's try to begin with a very simple system where we uh, essentially think of a quantum Hall system, or rather a two-dimensional non-interacting electron gas in the presence of a perpendicular magnetic field. Now, this is another problem which we have all solved, but let's just look at the classical picture of this electron. The classical picture is that this electron should go undergo cyclotron motion. So that's what happened to a charged particle when you apply a magnetic field. And then, you know, uh, this means that the electrons are localized because they just circle in tiny orbits. But near the edge of this uh, sample, 
okay, and any of these boundaries, what you find is that the cyclotron orbit cannot be completed because of scattering from the edge. So it just does this as shown here, what is called a skipping orbit. And this skipping orbit essentially leads to a directional. So it turns out that the classical picture is that the electrons undergo cyclotron motion at the bulk, and they have the skipping orbit giving it some direction, directionality of motion, okay, um, and in the uh, at the surface. Now this directionality of motion is fine; it breaks time reversal invariance, but that's okay because you have already broken time reversal invariance by putting in an external magnetic field. Okay, so that's perfectly fine. And the quantum picture of this is that electrons in a two-dimensional sample with a perpendicular magnetic field just gives rise to the Landau levels, which are basically harmonic oscillator levels. And these skipping orbits leads to uh, chiral states at the edge of the sample, which crosses the Fermi level. Okay, between which is typically between the two Landau levels out here. So what happens is that because of this boundary, you have additional time reversal uh, chiral A states, and this is a consequence of broken time reversal symmetry. There is another way to look into it, which is going to be important for our purpose. The first thing is that once you put in this magnetic field, if you take the electron wave function and you compute what is called the charm number for that wave function, and that is something that you can compute, I'm going to sort of explain this a little bit later. Okay, uh, you are going to see that this Chan number essentially is non-zero. Okay, the point is that that is a topological characteristic of the sample. Okay? Now, if you do the same thing in vacuum, the Chan number of course is going to be zero because the wave function is zero. But to go from a, a fixed non-zero topological number to a place where there is a where there is no topological number you have to pass through a gapless surface, otherwise the number cannot go to zero by itself. This is just like saying that in a superconductor, if you have a vortex, you can never eliminate it because it has a winding number. You cannot just do away with the winding number. What you need is an anti-vortex to fuse the two and return to vacuum. Uh, to, so, so the point is that to go from a region in space, which has a fixed topological invariant associated with the wave function residing on that space to another region where there is no such wave function, you need to have some intermediate gapless modes. Okay, because the computation of this charm number and the stability of this topological invariant depends on the fact that the wave functions are all separated from each other. And therefore, uh, the surface harbors gapless modes, and often these modes are very interesting. So the idea is that to go from a topologically non-trivial bulk to vacuum, you go through uh, a surface which harbors gapless modes. And those are the manifestation of this here are, are through this gapless edge. Now the point is that then, uh, once people understood how to do this, they did this for spin quantum Hall effect, where there are no external magnetic fields. But you have a spin orbit coupling, which leads to effective magnetic fields for the spin up and spin down in opposite direction. And they carry a pair of eight states. Okay. Here, uh, spin orbit, because of because this effective magnetic field comes from spin orbit interaction and they come in pair, uh, there is no violation of time reversal symmetry. So you have two A states carrying charges in opposite direction, but nevertheless, you have this thing, which is also uh, also have some non-trivial you know, uh, topological number in the bulk and they uh, lead to um, states at the edge, gapless states at the edge. Now, what are these topological insulators? The topological insulators are 3D categories of this 3D avatars of this 2D uh, uh, topological insulator, uh, so 2D topological materials. So, these 3D topological insulators essentially have a bulk, <coughs> and this bulk have bands which have topological characteristic, and in terms of the consequence of this is that you have uh, gapless states at the surface of this 3D topological material, and thus it turns out that the surface this comes in the form of Dirac cones. 
Okay, and there are a lot of literature regarding this, and there are this really interesting papers by Balance and Moore and Fu and Kane and others, and of course Rahul Rai, who was one of the first people to do this, and uh, essentially they showed how this can happen. But for our purpose, since the since in this topological insulator the bulk is insulating, all the transport happens at the surface, and that's what we are going to do. That. Okay. So I'm going to skip through this classification and directly come to the properties of these Dirac electrons on the surface. Okay. So let's talk about the helicity of this Dirac electron. So the typical Hamiltonian for these Dirac, Dirac electrons on the surface of a topological insulator is this. This just means that if, we, if Z is the direction which is perpendicular to the surface, you have a sigma x k y minus sigma y k x. And so, just as we did for graphene, there is a helicity properties. But in this case, it's a real spin of the electron which points perpendicular to its direction of motion, and it's not the single spin here. Okay. So one can show that if you take this Hamiltonian and diagonalize it, the wave functions that you get is something like this, where theta is tan inverse of ky over x. So, for example, if an electron moves along y, then uh, its spin points along x which can be substituted by putting theta equal to pi by 2 out here, actually sorry, theta equal to 0 out here, and so on, okay? So, the, what's the point? The point is that uh, these have helicity properties just as uh, the regular, this thing, uh, this just as the graphene electrons, and the consequence of this uh, helicity property is that if you have a standard barrier, which is not spin active, which doesn't keep spin by scattering, it cannot reflect the electron back. Okay, so that's a interesting property that one looks at. Now, one interesting property of this Dirac electrons, which I'm going to talk about in the subsequent slide, is that what happens when you apply a magnetic field parallel to the topological insulator surface, the 2D surface, which was this Dirac electrons. Now, if you apply a field, of course, a parallel to the surface, of course, there is no uh, orbital effect, okay? Uh, because, you know, in a 2D system, if you apply a field parallel to the surface, there is no orbital effect of the magnetic field. Just think of, uh, imagine that the magnetic field is, replaced, uh, is uh, represented using a gauge, 0, 0, B times Z, where Z is the third coordinate then you see that the electrons don't couple to it in orbital mode. But there is, of course, the Z-man effect, and the electron spins couple to this Z-man effect. But for this topological insulator, what happens is that this Z-man term, because I have applied the field along Y, okay, uh, this Z-man term just gives you a sigma YB, which essentially means that it's just a shift in the Kx. Okay? And this looks like a constant vector potential to these Dirac electrons because it just shifts its momentum. And as you know, constant vector potential doesn't do much. So applying a constant magnetic field along the surface does not have either orbital or Zeeman effect for this type of electrons. And that's a new thing, which is not there for Schrodinger electron. However, notice that if this field now has a space dependent dependence, then its effect is just like a fictitious magnetic field which is along z-direction, okay? Because if this field which is along, uh, so if this field depends on, say, y, then you have a definite curl which is del y uh, of this quantity, and that's like having a fictitious magnetic field uh, along the z-direction. Okay. So let me show you some experiments. So there are these ARPs experiment on Z2 topological insulators. So uh, they do some annual result photo emission spectroscopy, which means that they put a photon, and uh, when this when this photon scatters off the electrons on the Fermi surface or the Dirac Fermi surface, they just uh, you know sort of capture that electron, and knowing the initial energy of the photon and the final energy and momentum of the captured electron they can find out its position um, on the Fermi surface, and therefore they can map out the Fermi surface of the uh, electrons on the surface of the topological insulators. 
and that showed all these Dirac points. They can also find out the spin state of the electron um, that they capture. And from this, they determine that depending on the position on the Fermi surface and uh, its spin state, there is this chiral uh, chirality, okay, or the spin momentum locking that uh, that I talked about. So remember that I said that the electron spin points towards this direction of motion, which means spin and momentum are locked, and that is precisely what the experiments found. And this was the first uh, sort of kosher test which said that this surface state must be Dirac like. Okay. This was done in 2009. So there are also these STM data, which showed that scattering from the step edges on the surface. So if you have a surface, and then you have a step-like potential on that surface, then uh, scattering from that roughly vanishes, which makes the STM spectra very smooth. Okay, And that happens because electrons cannot go from K to minus K because of scattering from the step. And that has to do with the, you know, the, the uh, lack of um, spin flip because uh, you need to keep spins there if you want to reverse the direction of motion of this electron, which this state potential, which is not spin active, cannot be. Okay, now let me come to these junctions of topological insulators. And uh, let me try to sort of tell you uh, a thing that we worked on. So what we did is to put in a magnetic material on top of this topological insulator, which has this magnetization along M0. And it's simply uh, the film due to its proximity effect on the surface of the topological insulator induces a magnetization in this region too. So the magnetization, <coughs> excuse me, is a constant in region two but at the age of this region, you know, it decays to zero. And when it decays, it means that the magnetization is a special function. And this gives rise to this fictitious magnetic field that I've been talking about. So classically, when this, when you try to move an electron through this region, what happens is that at the age, the electron finds bends a little bit because, you know, for if this applied magnetization is weak, the electron bends a little bit because it sees a fictitious magnetic field. It's just like a cyclotron motion. But then eventually when it reaches this other surface, it sees an opposite magnetic field. <coughs> so it straightens out and you still have transport. But if you make a strong magnetic field out here, then the electron bends quite a bit and then it simply exits on the same direction on the other side. And this means you cut off all transport through this junction. So this means that there is a critical magnetization beyond which no quasi particles can pass through this junction. So this is like a switching effect where you can turn off transport, electrical transport of this junction by a magnetic switch, but just by tuning the magnetization of this stuff. Okay, so this is something that we worked on a long time back. But I am not going to get into the details, but let me just show you some picture. So this Z is essentially the effective magnetization. That, and you see, as I increase this Z, there comes a point, which is this critical value given by this red dotted line, beyond which um, everything is, comp uh, the tunneling conductance is completely zero. Okay? So the junction can be made opaque by tuning magnetization, which is like a magnetic control switch. So this happens not only with one junction, but with multiple junctions and you see similar effects and that's... Uh, so again, Dirac physics from the top of this topological insulator surface gives rise to uh, magnetotransport properties, which is which has no analog from its Schrodinger counterpart. Okay. So now let me finally come to the last uh, topic out here. Okay, which is while and multi while semimetals. So, while fermions are standard things which we know in field theory. So, how do they arise? So, you know, in typically relativistic fermions in D dimension have Dirac equations, and these gamma means are the Dirac matrices whose anti commutation relations are there. So, in odd dimension, for uh, odd dimensions, you can also define a matrix gamma phi, which is the product of all these gammas. Okay. <coughs> 
and this is uh, this gamma phi can be defined only in odd dimensions as everybody knows but the point is that if the mass is zero it can be shown that the dirac hamiltonian uh, commutes with gamma phi okay as a result you can have simultaneous eigenbasis for gamma phi and uh, the dirac thing and so it turns out that you have two classes of wild fermions one corresponding to an eigen state of gamma phi with plus one which is the positive helicity and the other one minus and which is the negative helicity so when this mass is zero uh, yeah. can anybody think of this gamma phi to be the helicity gamma phi is indeed the helicity yes yes uh, yeah so gamma phi equal to 1 and minus 1 or the two uh, you know plus and minus the two chiralities essential yes yeah so so as you see you know this uh, thing would be uh, gamma phi would just act as the helicity of this uh, stuff okay so these fermions are eigen states uh, of gamma phi and uh, they are kind of okay so that's the uh, so how does it appear in condensed matter in condensed matter this wild structure appears from a effective 2 by 2 matrix hamiltonian which arises out of band touching of conduction and valence band now you see that if you have essentially two bands in a complicated condensed matter system they can always touch but the point is that there are two reasons why these wild materials are discovered only recently and they are not that numerous the first reason is that this touching has to be robust it has to be protected by some symmetry so that if you don't if you change the parameters just a little bit they don't just vanish and the second thing is that it has to be at the fermi energy so that the co consequence of this touching and the resultant quasi particles are seen at the fermi level so that they are effective low so you can build effective low energy theories out of this now what are the symmetries that protect that kind of band touching these are spin rotational symmetry time reversal symmetry and inversion symmetry and they can, each of them can be lifted okay so the spin reversal symmetry can be lifted by either some kind of magnetic order or if you have spin orbit coupling now uh, time reversal symmetry can be broken or lifted by putting just putting a magnetic field and inversion symmetry is continuously broken crystals where which are not inversion symmetric so there are lack of inversion centers and you can have crystals like that so for a wild phase what we need is to break at least two of this so that a pair of non degenerate bands may cross at special points in the bridgeon zone okay uh, and this is typically done by choosing materials with strong spin orbit coupling so that the spin rotational symmetry is broken and then you choose to break one of the two either the inversion or the time reverse okay also it is to be noted that if you have two of this so if you have this uh, this kind of band touching you are always going to have them in a pair and this goes by this uh, what we call in condensed matter as the no go theorem uh, so i think its formal name is this uh, what is this i forget this so there is this theorem in lattice based theory which tells you that all dirac points must come in pair in any lattice theory i think it's nishi uh, ninomia and uh, somebody else okay so so the point is that in any lattice theory this kind of wild points would come in pair so there are at least two of them in case of this uh, in uh, any of this crossing and there is a very simple way to understand why they have to come in pair because think of a brillouin zone in a condensed matter system now if you make a small circle around the center of this brillouin zone this is completely equivalent by periodicity by making a big circle around the brillouin zone so think of a circular brillouin zone for example a small circle around the center is completely equivalent to a small uh, a large circle drawn around the uh, exit uh, along the radius of that circular bilion zone okay along the circumference of that circular bilion zone sorry so the first circle if you want to just count the number of lattice point so number of uh, such wild phase wild points around uh, within that small circle it's clearly zero okay because this can be at any point in your bilion zone and 
we assume that it's not at the bank center. Now, this means that uh, if you count the number of um, churn number of this uh, stuff for the small circle, uh, it must be zero. Because you know, if you just circle your uh, wave functions with that small circle around the center, there are no crossings and the churn number has to be zero out there. So there is no um, so-called vortices in momentum space. So these white points are like vortices in momentum space. So there are no such vortices within that small circle. But therefore, you cannot have any net vorticity if you circle around the entire blue line zone. Otherwise, there is no periodicity concept. Okay, and therefore, inside the entire blue line zone, there must be an even number of such uh, y points whose vorticities must cancel each other. So, if you have a y point with plus vorticity, it's going to cancel the one with minus vorticity. So, okay, so from that one can develop our low energy theory of this. I'm not going to get into these details of this type one or type two or anything like that. And this leads to several properties. For example, you know, you have things like called the Parmi arc states. So this also has surface properties and this, sur this states form an arc like shape. And this is called a Parmi arc. You have what is called a chiral anomaly for this kind of state. So if you apply electric and magnetic field, both in the same direction, you have transport of fermions from one wild point to the other. Okay, and there is an equation for that. You have quadratic dependence of magnetoconductivity, which is unusual, typically you have linear, and so on, okay. <clears throat> this has also been seen experimentally because you have this tantalum arsenide, where this kind of things saw these Fermi arc-like states on the surface, and these were taken to be proof of having uh, these wild semi-metals. This was done in 2015. And finally, uh, you have something called multi-wild semi-metals, where these wild nodes can coalesce. So let me just, uh, okay, let me not get into the details of this, but it's just that, you know, this for these multi-wild semi-metals, what happens is that the dispersion is not linear. There are these quadratic band touchings that come in, where J could be anything like two, three, or four, and two, and uh, for the transverse momentum. And uh, so, what we are going to now look at is this transport across a while and a multi-while semi-metal. Okay. So the idea is the following. So suppose, so let me just get into this. So suppose I have a junction where in region one, I have a wild semimetal and in region three, I have a multi-wild semimetal. And then I want to look at the transport of this. Okay, so in region one, you can think of a wild semimetal, wild electron to sort of go and approach the barrier uh, region, which is this region two where you have put in a barrier potential u naught. And uh, then what happens is that the electron gets reflected from here. And then in region three, there is a transmission. So the wave function in region one is a superposition of the approaching electron and the reflected one. In region three is this transmission. And in region two, what happens is that uh, there is left and right moving uh, electrons, while semi metal, uh, so while electrons out here. So I'm going to take the case where the uh, topological winding number of these while nodes is one in region one and two, I call that N1, but it's really one. And in region three, I have a multi-wild semi-metal where this topological winding number is different from one. It could be two, three, etc. Okay. So uh, what I do is then match, uh, so what I do is then try to match the wave functions at the boundaries of this, which is this typical, and then calculate the tunneling point. So without getting into the details of this, let me just point out a very interesting thing. So if I try to match the boundary condition, again in the thin barrier limit where this D, this thickness of this region goes to zero, if you do a calculation, what you find is that the condition that comes out is that the phase of the wave function in region one must be related to the phase of the wave function in region three with this e to the power tau z chi factor, where tau z is uh, uh, where tau z is one of the three directions. Okay, is the longitudinal direction in which there is electron transport. 
and ties the dimensionless barrier potential. Now, if you look at the wave function in region one, okay, you would find that you know uh, it also has a tau z dependence, which depends on this topological winding number. So let me just go here. Topological winding number n one, coupled with this transverse momentum out here. This phi k is tan inverse of k y k x. Okay. So if you just put this for psi one and this for psi two. You see that the combination that appears here is n one minus n two plus psi, okay, uh, something like this. Okay? So now, if you calculate the transmission from there after some calculation, you find that the transmission depends on the transverse momentum k x and k y through this phi k by this combination. Okay, but now look. to get the transmission i need to sum over all transverse momenta because you know that's how you calculate transmission which means you need to integrate over all possible values of phi k but if you have to do this with a transmission function like this what happens is that you can absorb this barrier potential as a shift in this phi k provided n1 and n2 are different which means that this phi k integral makes the transmission and hence the tunneling conductance completely barrier independent so no matter what value of the barrier potential you put in you get the same value of transmission uh, same value of conductance this means your transmission becomes barrier independent in the thin barrier limit and this is again a completely different phenomenon compared to standard transport in 3d material okay and this is something that we numerically verify of course we came up with the theory of this but that's different we numerically verify this you see that this is the case when uh, i plot this g over g not as a function of dimensionless barrier strength so when n1 and n2 are different this thing is completely static where when n1 is equal to n2 you see that there is this oscillatory behavior which you will evaluate so to sum this up okay let me just tell you that the bell so the topological nature of wave functions so in a condensed matter system can give rise to fluidity as fluidity implications it basically give rise to quasi particles in low energies which whose properties are completely different compared to uh, you know standard electrons which obey schrodinger equation and this leads to several interesting phenomena including the transport that we are looking into here so in case of transport we find that it can give rise to oscillatory dependence of transport on the barrier potential or complete independence of tran the transport conduct tunneling conductance of the barrier potential and both of these are essentially completely qualitatively distinct properties that you see in from that of a normal matter okay and there are several other properties and i would like to conclude by saying that this kind of dirac properties being realized in condensed matter system for the first time gives you an opportunity to look at what happens when you have interacting dirac theory okay which can never be tested in high energy physics but now we have a platform for testing its properties and there are many unconventional features not just the transport that comes up here and there are many nice review articles regarding this which you can look at so i think i'm going to stop here and thank you for your attention thank you uh, for the nice talk that you have given uh, if uh, the participant i can see one participant is there if you have any question you can ask or like before that i just want to give a clap for Uh, Professor Sen Gupta for giving this nice talk. Uh, well, thank you. I, I just want to ask. It's a very nice question. So you yeah. have covered the this Dirac metal and this wild um, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. Like, what is the prospect of this Majorana fermions? Oh, that's whole another story. I didn't include it because I was afraid that it would get too long. But uh, Majorana fermions are now. Okay, so the experimental story of this, as far as I understand, is the following: that people have looked into this one-dimensional thin nanowires where they induce superconductivity by proximity effect, 
And there, at the edge, they have seen signatures of Marana permits. Now, the question is, how do you detect them? If the detection of this comes through either Josephson effect or measurement of tunneling conductance, and they have done both. For the tunneling conductance, they have seen a peak at zero energy, which was taken to be a signature. However, the, uh, the height of this peak was supposed to be two in some units, in units of e square over h. But it came out to be something like 0.1, which was way lower than necessary. So people started asking questions whether this is really this uh, uh, stuff. But uh, and I am really not entirely sure of what the final conclusion about this is because uh, this was a bottleneck for quite a few years. I don't know how or if at all, if it is at all result. I haven't followed the literature. The second thing is about Josephson junction, which I have followed, and people have looked into this um, Josephson effect, and there is a prediction which was done by Kitev, and also during my PhD thesis, I worked on this. So the point is that this Josephson junction, um, uh, for this kind of materials, where there is this iron of Permian, uh, harbors something called a fractional Josephson effect. And the upshot of this is that the, uh, so when you measure this Josephson current in the presence of microwave radiation, you see plateau-like structure in the current voltage characteristic, which is called the Shapiro steps. So the upshot of all this is that only the even valued Shapiro steps are going to appear and the odds one are going to disappear. Okay, so this was the prediction and that people have seen to some extent. There are some nature physics paper and, uh, so. and after that there are several verifications of at least the Josephson effect uh, thing. And uh, I think the field remains there. Uh, whether or not the next step can be taken, that is using this to do quantum computing or other stuff, and that of course is next level of technology, and I don't think anybody has a way of uh, reaching that yet. Okay. Thank you for the answer. And uh, my next question is, everywhere you have mentioned about this charm number, topological phases, and yeah. I'm just asking, is this related to this uh, very kind of phase or? Yes, it's the same thing really. So you see, it's really in some sense vorticity. So if you take a vortex and you calculate its winding number by going around it, you know, uh, you find out some two pi times of integer, right? Sure. Look at this Dirac fermion. So think of this graphing, you know, these bands that you have, right? Crossing of this. So you see that if I look at this band crossing, I can always describe this band dispersion by a mod k, which is the absolute value of the momentum, and a transverse angle, which is this phi. So phi is not really well defined at the origin, as you know. Okay. So these data crossings are like vortices in momentum space. Okay, and if you now take a wave function and see what happens as you go across this wave function around this Dirac cone in momentum space, you find out a vorticity, and that is precisely the charm number. So all this charm number, Berry phase, vorticity, they are really same at some level. Okay. You just do some calculation in real space and some other in momentum space. That's pretty much it. But it is basically dynamic. It is, yeah, it is dynamical. But however, most of the time you talk about this in the adiabatic limit, where the dynamics is really slow and uh, you calculate those. Yeah. I can see one question from the participant. Sir, what is effective field? Oh, is there something on the chat? Okay, let me try to. Yeah. Uh, where is the chat? Uh, you can see that there I is got a it. Chat. Effective field. Okay, so what's the context of this uh, question? Actually, if you can, Sima, could you please tell which context you have asked this question? You please unmute. Don't uh, feel shy. Please unmute and ask the question. I don't get. You can also type. That's easier. Whatever. Sir, yeah. 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 I I can context and uh, is about the effective field and uh, something about electron uh, in, a, um, in a uniform magnetic field and you will... Oh, okay, that. So, okay, let me sort of uh, get to that. Uh, so, 
here, right? So this, so what I mean by an effective field here, that's what you asked, right? Is that correct? Yes, that is true. Yeah. So you see, if I apply a magnetic field, a Zeeman magnetic field along Y, okay? So what happens is that I already had a dispersion of this, which is sigma cross K, which means I had a sigma X K Y minus sigma Y K X, right? Out here. Now, if I apply a magnetic field, then of course, what will happen is that I'm going to have a Zeeman term, but this Zeeman term now, is going to be just some constant times b as a shift to this kx, which comes to sigma y, because you know Zeeman term is like sigma y times some constant times b, which is applied along y direction. So I can group my terms so that this is like. But if you just look at this term, you know this kx minus alpha b, this is just like applying a vector potential, right? Because kx is shifted by an amount, then by definition that amount is like a vector potential which couples to your electron. So the magnetic field for this kind of systems appears like a vector potential. Okay. Now, if this vector potential is a constant, this is like saying that you haven't really applied so any field. It's like a constant vector potential, right? And that doesn't do anything to the energy of these electrons. Because if you shift your momentum by a constant value, you know, your energies and etc., those really don't change. You can simply reabsorb that change in the definition of your momentum. However, if your magnetic field now depends on X, okay, this is like a vector potential which depends on coordinates. And then, of course, if it has a finite curve, then you can think of it as a magnetic field which is giving rise to this kind of vector potential. That magnetic field you haven't applied in the laboratory, but nevertheless, these Duffin electrons essentially see it. Okay, so and that's why you call it an effective field. Okay, is that clear? Okay, thank you, sir. I got it. Okay, thank you. Uh, I had one question which yeah. was related to when you talked about this uh, calculating transmission coefficient, reflection coefficient, etc. So, like, uh, there, there is one more thing I, I like. So, some people study the the localization effect, it's like with like Anderson type of localization or something sure, like that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Some people these days study the other many body localization techniques. Yes. Like, so could you please comment on that a little bit? Okay. So here I have taken a ballistic junction, which by definition means that I'm completely free of disorder. But of course, this is not the real thing in this kind of stuff. So what happens is that uh, if you have a, so, but there is a saving grace that generally in a standard Schrodinger metal in 2D, even a little amount of disorder is completely going to localize all your junctions and render this description ineffective. But these class of materials do not bring, uh, belong to the same symmetry class as standard Schrodinger electrons. So there Anderson localization doesn't hold in such a strong form. Yeah, so if it can sustain a little bit of disorder. So at least this calculation, the qualitative part is going to be okay in the weak disorder limit, but not in the strong disorder limit. Now, if you go to strong disorder, everything is going to be localized and then, you know, this is of course not going to be valid. And also I have for most part of the thing talked about non-interacting electron and in that case NBL is not going to come. What's going to come is of course standard non inter so Anderson kind of insulator. However, if you put a very strong disorder in these systems and you put in an interaction, then of course NBL is going to kick in. Okay. Yeah. But that I don't know if it is going to be terribly different from standard NBL because you know that's a that's not really a low energy property. NBL is a property of the entire Hilbert space, whereas this topology is a property of the low energy states in the Hilbert space. Yeah, so, so Sima, do, do you have any other further question? If not, uh, then... Uh, no, sir. I, I can't have any questions. You don't have any questions. So, uh, thank you. Uh,
Professor Sengupta for your nice talk and contribution. Thank you. This will be posted in YouTube my, in my channel. I will share the link with you. You can share with students and all. Okay. And, um, yeah, so stay safe and healthy. That's Yeah, you too. Uh, yeah. Hopefully, this is, we are going to meet in person someday. <laughs> sure. Yeah. So, okay, bye. bye. Yeah.